next presentation is going to be uh, by uh, Professor Michael Dixon, and the title is Mechanical Therapies for Atrial Fibrillation, Ablation, and LA Occlusion. Please, Michael. Thank you, Yossi, Dr. Antman, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> I'm, I'm glad to be here on this uh, historical occasion of the, of the first uh, joint session of the Israel Heart Society and the American Heart Association. I'm sure that this is the beginning of a long-standing collaboration. Uh, my topic today is to discuss invasive approaches to atrial fibrillation, or more specifically, I'm going to discuss the current status of atrial fibrillation ablation. And this talk is mainly uh, aimed at the general cardiologist who wants to, who considers referring a patient to ablation and has to discuss this option with the patient. Uh, the topics that I'm going to touch on are the ov uh, overview of the evolution of ablation, efficacy and complication of the procedure, does it obviate the need for anticoagulation, do we change the natural history, uh, who are the best candidates for AFib ablation, and a few words if you have time on flutter ablation and the role, current role of pace and ablate approach or AV nodal ablation. Of course, all this effort uh, to do AFib ablation comes from the disadvantage, known disadvantages of antiarrhythmic medications. We know that it has a modest effect in preventing atrial fibrillation. It has side effects. It has complications. I'm talking about the medical treatment. There's a risk of proarrhythmia and increased mortality. Then there are a few studies, and including a sub-analysis of the AFFIRM study that actually show that mortality increases with antiarrhythmic therapy. We know that there is no advantage over rate control. It doesn't obviate the need for anticoagulants, and it doesn't affect the natural history of the disease. How about ablation? The evolution of ablation over time, it began in the late 90s with a seminal work of, of the Bordeaux group that found that uh, the pulmonary veins are the source of, uh, um, of atrial fibrillation. You see the pointer here? Uh, actually, years before, the surgeons did maze procedure, which is still the most efficient way of preventing atrial fibrillation, only that it costs the surgery. That's why it didn't take off, but uh, um, it, it's still the most effective, uh, effective way to control atrial fibrillation. But Hesseger and his colleagues found the pulmonary vein and started ablating within the vein, and shortly thereafter they realized that if you ablate one focus, another focus shows up, and they switched to a method of isolating the pulmonary veins using this lasso catheter that sticks into the entrance to the vein, finds the muscle sleeves that go into the vein from the atrium, and ablating them. Uh, this is a, what we call a, pul a pulmonic vein isolation. Uh, several years later, Paponi from Italy established the method of circumferential atrial fibrillation ablation around the pulmonary, circumferential lesions around the pulmonary veins, including some of the area of the atrium, debulking of the atria, if you want to call it this way. And this is basic, the basis of many of the ablations that are done today. Over the years, there were a f uh, several additions to this uh, method. One of them was the addition of ablation lines, mainly for cases with persistent atrial fibrillation. I'm not going to discuss it too thoroughly. The other was the addition of what we call cafe ablation. Cafe ablation is, is the ablation of areas that for some unclear reason, still unclear, are essential to the maintenance of atrial fibrillation, and they are characterized by special fractionated activity, and we go around the atrium and ablate them in cases of persistent atrial fibrillation. Another step forward over the last few years was the use of, of the single shot techniques, either using balloons, this is the Creo balloon, which is widely available also in this country, and the other are, are single shot ablation catheter, rounded catheter that surround the pulmonary veins and, and uh, ablate them all at once. Several other developments that occurred over the years are the use of irrigated tip catheters that are sa safer and more effective than the traditional catheters. We always proof that pulmonary veins are isolated. We learned that this increases the efficacy of the procedure, and also the recent use of contact sensors that make the ablation more effective and safer. There are other newer techniques that I'm not going to touch on because they are not ready for prime time yet. What about the results of atrial fibrillation ablation? 
these authors uh, did a meta-analysis of many studies that compared atrial fibrillation ablation with medical therapy. They surveyed hundreds of studies and came up with 11 high-quality studies according to the score that grade studies by their quality. All these studies compare ablation to antiarrhythmic medication. They have a, at least nine months of follow-up, most of them more than a year. They have meticulous follow-up, including monitoring for silent atrial fibrillation uh, as a measure of recurrence. Patients in these studies were relatively young, healthy, with reasonable left atrial size. Three studies, the top three, were initial approach studies, which means that patients who were naive, never got any treatment, were randomized between medical treatment and ablation, and the others were patients who already got antiarrhythmic medications. Two of the studies dealt with persistent patients. The others dealt with both, mainly paroxysmal. If you look at the bottom line of the meta-analysis, at the numbers, we have here about uh, almost 1,500 patients from all 11 studies. 70% uh, of them were paroxysmal. The, the rest were persistent. Uh, about 500 were drug naive, where the ablation was the initial approach compared to medical treatment and uh, only 17% had structural heart disease. The bottom line of this meta-analysis was as follows. Arrhythmia recurred over somewhere between one and two years in 28% of the patients who underwent ablation and in 65% of the patients who received medical treatment. So there was a significant advantage as far as recurrence of atrial fibrillation to the approach of ablation. If you look at the series of first, first line treatment, the advantage was, less, was less, still significant but less impressive because there were less recurrences in the medical treatment group. There were only 44% that recurred with medical ther therapy. If we went to the second line ablations, those who already failed medical treatment, they had 80% recurrence on medical th therapy and less than 30% on ablation. So here the ablation was much more effective in comparison to drug therapy. Major adverse events, which I'm going to, to return to, occurred in 5% of the cases, and there was a considerable crossover rate. About one quarter of the patients that, went, that were randomized to medical treatment crossed over to ablation. So overall, RF ablation is clearly better than antiarrhythmic therapy in prevention of recurrence of atrial fibrillation in a relatively healthy population. The clinical results uh, are, are even better as, as not all the silent atrial fibrillation uh, episodes are felt by the patient. So the clinical result may be even better because recurrence here may include five minutes of silent atrial fibrillation detected by Holter. What about long-term results? This group of, of uh, a German group that uh, is very active in atrial fibrillation ablation looked at their results of atrial fibrillation ablation, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, circumferential pulmonary vein isolation five years later. What they came up with was that if they did one procedure only, they had about 50% recurrence of atrial fibrillation. If patients underwent more than one procedure, if they had recurrence, they underwent another procedure, an average of 1.6 procedures per patient, then they ended up with 80% freedom from atrial fibrillation after five years. And this is based on about 160 patients that they followed over five years. If we look at the, of, at the five year results of persistent atrial fibrillation, this is what we have. Uh, ignore the, the different lines because they, do, they represent different techniques. But the bottom line is that if you ablate persistent atrial fibrillation once, then after five years, you have less than 20% maintenance of sinus rhythm, which is very bad. If you do it more than once, then you end up with about 50% freedom from atrial fibrillation in patients with persistent atrial fibrillation undergoing ablation more than once. Not surprisingly, at almost the same time, another group from Germany came with exactly the same results. 20% maintenance of sinus if you ablate once, about 50% if you ablate more than one, once in persistent atrial fibrillation patients. And this is... I think this, these are the numbers that we should remember. One year freedom from atrial fibrillation in PATH ablation is 70 to 80%. The five year freedom is about 
If you do it more than once, you, ca you can come up to 80% freedom from atrial fibrillation in puffers. If you look at persistent atrial fibrillation, about 60% success over one year, 20% success after five years, that can increase up to 60 if you do the ablation more than once. This is the bottom line. How about complications? I'm going back to this meta-analysis that showed about 5% compli major complications in the group of, of uh, atrial fibrillation ablation compared to about 2% in the medical therapy group. About half of the complications were co pericardial, mainly tamponade, and the others were a little bit of everything. There, were, there was a 0.5% death over one year. The usual number of deaths in atrial fibrillation ablation, the quoted number is one per thousand. Uh, we have to remember that these numbers are based on the previous decade ablations. These authors analyzed these results comparing early series to late series and realized that over the last few years, the numbers of complications went down. But, so these numbers are more consistent with, with what we had about 10 years ago, but this is what we have, and they are consistent with the world survey that was published at about the same time. However, this rate of complication is not, uh, is not something that, uh, of course, complications are the major drawback of atrial fibrillation ablation, but they are not a necessary evil these days. If you look at this publication that came from one of the prominent institutions in the United States, you can see that over the years and with accumulating experience, on the first year they had about 10% major complications, but over the years they come down to less than 2% complication of the procedure with the increasing number of procedures. This series looked at more than 90,000 patients in American databases, health databases, and they were able to show that an operator that performs more than 25 AFib procedures per year, the complication rate goes down to about 2.5% and below 2% if more than 50 procedures are done per year by the same operator. So operator experience is very important, and I think that at this stage we are closer to the more experienced than the less experienced operators. And also, just to mention a group from Australia that do a solid work. Uh, they do exactly the same over the years. Rafael Russo, I don't know whether he's here, was part of this group and part of this, uh, this uh, uh, publication. They looked at their experience with 500 cases, 80% of them were puffers, and the bottom line is that they had less than 1% severe complication. So this is something that is realistic and we should aim at. Just one word on one-shot ablations, I'm not going, I don't have the time to go over the, all the details. Basically, they can be done either with a circular catheter around the pulmonary vein or with a balloon that is stuck into the entrance to the vein. Generally speaking, I think that we can say that their efficacy is more or less the same as the radiofrequency ablation. They have similar or somewhat lower complication rate, less pericardial complications, and the procedure time is considerably shorter. This is as much as the, as the one-shot ablations. Now, one of the hopes from any eff effective AFib treatment is to be able to get rid of the anticoagulant. And the question is whether we have reached this point with AFib ablation. Theoretically, there are many reasons not to stop anticoagulants because the recurrence rate is high and many of the recurrences are asymptomatic and the patient doesn't even know that he has recurrence. There is no meticul in, in real life, there is no meticulous monitoring as we had in studies. So the recurrence rate may be high, asymptomatic, and patients may have strokes. The risk of atrial fibrillation is real even for short episodes of five minutes. We know it from pacemaker studies. And, uh, and we know that stroke occurs in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation patients even not in the presence of PATH. So all these theoretical considerations make us be suspicious about stopping anticoagulants. However, if we look at real-time results, uh, real-life results, these are results of three different series that did stop anticoagulants after several months of successful atrial fibrillation ablation and resumed the anticoagulation only if there was evidence of recurrence. This, these were not randomized controlled trials. These were just large series looking at their own results. 
Many of the patients had low CHAD score, but some of them had one or two or even more that were indicated for anticoagulation. Their follow-up time was fairly long. They had between two to four years of follow-up. And if you look at the event rate, it was very, very low. So the real-life data really point to reduced need for anticoagulation following ablation. All these studies are retrospective analysis of existing trials and were not designed to test this particular, uh, specific question. They all stop the oral anticoagulant in patients who maintain sinus rhythm. So overall, there is a clear trend toward reduction in thromboembolic phenomena or events after ablation. But the evidence is still insufficient in view of the theoretical concerns, and so far the guidelines still recommend continuing anticoagulation following RF ablation according to the CHAD score unrelated to the success of ablation. If you ask me, in the future we will be able probably to stop anticoagulants, and there are several large-scale studies that are running looking at that specific question. The hint is that the thromboembolic rate long after atrial fibrillation ablation are very low. The second question is whether ablation changes the natural history of long-term or, or the long-term prognosis of atrial fibrillation. Does it reduce the progression to permanent atrial fibrillation? Does it reduce the amount of strokes? Does it reduce progression to heart failure? And does it improve survival? Medical treatment, by the way, does not change. This, this is well known from, from, from uh, medical studies. Does ablation change it? I can tell you that there are several single center studies comparing, pay, comparing ablation to historical controls or to matched cases. All of them point to reduction in all these endpoints. But none of them is a randomized control study, and none of them is considered strong enough strong enough to support these arguments as reasons to ablate. So currently, we, we view atrial fibrillation ablation as a treatment for symptoms. Natural history at this point is not considered changed by, by ablation. And again, large-scale studies such as Cabana and East are looking into these specific questions, and our viewpoint may change in a few years. So what are the points to discuss with your patient who is considering AFib ablation. You should tell him that ablation is more effective than drug therapy in preventing AFib recurrences. That AFib ablation is currently aimed to treat symptoms and improve quality of life. It does not eliminate the need for long-term anticoagulation, nor does it make the patient healthier or prolongs his life. The patient should have realistic perception, perception of the success rate uh, further ablations may be needed to achieve success, and patients should be aware of it. Serious complications may sometimes occur. The most common one is tamponade. Overall, overall complication rates are realistically somewhere around 2%. Complication rates are significantly lower in high-volume centers with experienced operators. And when this, this is translate, translated into the recent guidelines of the American Heart Association, of the ACC, that takes a, an approach of class one indication for ablation in paroxysmal AF refractory to medical treatment. And, and it does mention that patient has to be well informed and a thorough assessment of the situation should be performed. And there's a class 2A indication for AFib ablation in patients who have not failed medical therapy as a first option. It's a 2A indication for some patients who may wish to undergo initial ablation as a first therapy. And also there is a 2A indication for ablating persistent atrial fibrillation, but only those who failed medical therapy. So who are the candidates for AFib ablation as first line therapy or as very early line therapy? These are the young, healthy, relatively healthy individual who are unable or unwilling to take medications those who have a combination of PATH and sick sinus who are going to develop bradycardia from any medication and may even need a pacemaker, then they should rather go to have initial ablation. Athletes with atrial fibrillation are not rare, and they are good candidates for ablation as a first-line therapy. Procedures should be performed in high-volume centers by experienced operators. 
Uh, in the interest of time, I think that I'm going to skip the role of cover tricuspid line, the, what we call atrial flutter ablation, and the role, current role of AV nodal ablation. Each one of them has its role, but uh, I think that in the interest of time, I'm going to skip it. Thank you.